This is not a case of who done it. The person who done it is sitting before you today. He was seeing someone who was identifying as a male. Ezra McKinley was gender confused. When I met Ezra, I did not know whether she was binary, non-binary, male, female. She is standing trial for stabbing one of her lovers to death. Was this murder? She fought to survive. One person attacked the other, but who did it? It's my girlfriend's car, or okay. my ex-girlfriend. We're kind of in a situation. Her story doesn't seem believable, so they're trying her for murder. How many stab wounds are too much for self-defense? I didn't know what to believe anymore. I was really afraid. I just didn't know who to trust. Her wounds could have been self-inflicted. This case is about an extreme anger and a twisted form of love. Okay, welcome back to Court TV Live. Perfect timing. The jury is back. Let's get you back into the courtroom. I'm going to the state's case, that very first draw. So I'm going to do that to clear up the record. That's Exhibit 690. It'll be exhibit 698. 698. I want to advise the court that I don't see any need to handle gloves, to use gloves to handle these exhibits. I've told that to Mr. DeFore. Mr. DeFore wants to be sure that I would put on the record that I'm not using gloves and that any future litigation, there will be no future litigation or any litigation is waived as respects DNA evidence or fingerprint evidence as to these books. If my DNA or my fingerprints show up on these books, that's not really a relevant issue in this case. Everybody knows who the journals are, and I don't see any reason to use gloves to do Is that. Is that a correct characterization, Mr. DeFore? Yes, Your Honor. I just want the record to be clear that uh, should there you know, that basically should there later be a claim that somehow these exhibits have been, uh, that evidence potentially DNA and or fingerprint evidence that might be uh, potentially exculpatory has been lost from them, uh, that it's not the result of any action by the state, but a uh, conscious decision by defense counsel at trial. All right. That is correct. Observe. I just wanted to do that before the jury comes in so we don't have to bother with that. All right. So if we could, if the clerk could cut open the exhibit that's not in evidence yet, that'll be 698. Description of exhibit 698. Six, 698? Yes. Okay. The description of number 698 is that it is a notebook called Personal Notes and Research Ideas and the Quest to Understand, which has already been referred to in testimony. <coughs> okay. So we just want to put that in the record formally because that hasn't been done yet. And where are the other pre- the other March is, 20 March 1st 2018 journals are they in evidence already? I don't think so, check. and I'm not going to have any testimony about them. I don't know if the state put them in evidence or not. The pre pre March 1, 18. Yeah, I just wondered if you you know if there's any others that you're. Okay, there's one. I, I'm not going to put in anything that's not in evidence already. If that's okay. what the court's asking, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Yes. Okay.
Is it 652 in the evidence? So, Judge, there's just been something confusing about the record. Uh, Mr. DeFore stated that the journal called, I met a man walking through a briar patch. He was looking for the rose promised by the thorns was not in evidence, but in fact it is. It's exhibit number 652. And in that particular journal, there are essays in that journal. There is an essay that I am going to be using because it was written on... February 12th of 2018. It's called A Quiet Morning. I'm going to show it well, to Mr. Your Honor, I'm going to object to that one. Council uh, specifically sent in and provided to us as part of the court's order a listing of those essays that they and journal entries that they intended to use. That one is not one of the ones that was in the list of uh, entries that they were going to use. I, I went through them all yesterday, and I went through them from the list that the council had given us, and that one's not in there. Right, Ms. Fisher. So, Judge, I'm going to ask the court, notwithstanding, first of all, this entry, as the court can see, and I will show it to you, is extremely short. It fits on one page. What my DNA? Okay, you know what? I, I'm just bringing it over so you can see it. Because All right. Well, far away. You know, we had the rule. You know, it, it, the ruling, and if it wasn't part of what was previously disclosed, again, and this is a, a management issue related to time and cumulative evidence and so forth. So, if it's not on the list, it's not allowed. Can I just? I'm going to let Mr. Um, Nelson address the court because I wasn't personally involved in the preparation. But what I want to just say for the record is this essay is so short that it would be hard to say, and because it was recovered by the state, because the states had access to all of these, it would be uh, unfair and prejudicial to Ms. McCandless if, in fact, we made an error to not allow this very short essay into evidence which the state has had throughout this case, and the state, in fact, it was the state who put this journal into evidence, not the defense. Uh, therefore, I would argue that I should be able to use the contents of an exhibit that the state made. Now, I think Mr. Nelson perhaps has something additional he would like to say. I, I'm not sure. Judge, just in our original McMorris motion, as well as our amended McMorris motion, I believe we did include lists. This was our intent, but I think we made abundantly clear throughout all of our writings that trial is a dynamic process. During the trial, we may make other requests. So I appreciate your honor's ruling, but I don't think we limited ourselves to ever agree we are going to be limited by certain things. We said, here's what our intention is, here's how we're going to try to narrow it down, this is what we're going to try to do, but there might be some excerpts that are not included in this list, and this is one of those excerpts. It's from February 12, 2018, as Ms. Vishni said, it's already, the journal itself is already in evidence. And there was no limitation to the journal itself when it was entered. Well, why was this not provided or, you know, again, to the state that, you know, that you were planning to use this particular excerpt along with the transcript? Well, first of all, it wasn't. The state gave all of this to us, so it's not as if we didn't provide it to them. The state said, we found these journals, and then they've made copies okay, of it. Okay, I understand that, but I mean, the reason for boiling this down is that this trial could last weeks and weeks and weeks beyond where we are now if you go into all these journals. And the court gave you approximately four hours to present the evidence of from the journals. This is... And so, and also ordered that the... Uh, those excerpts that you intended to use from the journals be provided to the state along with, again, an accurate transcript of those portions. And uh, so that was decided weeks ago. I, I, and I, I'm and I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know what's in that portion. It seems short. Uh, I'll read it. I'll, I have a well, if you want to read it into the record. Um, we have a typed version of it. If does, your does, a, to, does the state have a copy of that? I, I don't know what uh, DOJ page number it is. So I'm, Here it is, sir. I'm just going to read it into the record. I'll read it right from the book because okay, it's not slow. hard to read. Remember, read slow. Thank you. Order. Okay. I awoke one morning 
You held tightly in my arms, the gentle intimacy of night stored as warmth, light diffused through thin curtains, chasing through thin, I'm sorry, that's a typo, thin curtains. Can you read that sentence again? Light diffused through thin curtains, chasing sleep away. Day called for its turn in our lives. I loosened my grip. A harsh anxiety followed. If I were to let go, you would leave entirely. Your soft flesh became chained. It would take memory away. Day called or its turn in our lives. I love you. I love you too. A simple exchange put my anxiety into question. My embrace unraveled, fingertips lingering. Our lives opened for day's claim. Soon, night will return, yet without you. Possibly, so I am afraid to let go. Okay, you made your record. And Ms. McCandless, if she, it was again, it's only offered or received, I should say, or this information for her state of mind. So if she makes some reference, but again, I'm sticking to that pretrial ruling. Otherwise, uh, again, we have to keep this at some manageable length of time. And in the court's opinion, that would be somewhat cumulative. Um, I think you've already introduced a, enough uh, about this so that she can kind of describe what it was in her mind. That's what's important. That's what's relevant is what might have been in her mind, not what he exactly what he wrote. Well, this is in her mind. This was written February 12th, and she's seen this. Well, right? It appears to be a poem to me, but. She can testify to that aspect of it without you showing the journal that was in part of her state of mind and led to her, you know, if it led to her fear or concern for her safety, that you can do. Okay, okay. so yeah, just so I understand the court's ruling, can I read from this? And I, I wouldn't read the no. whole poem. Can Can't I read, read a couple of lines and say, Alex wrote this, what did you think about this? Did you discuss it with him? What, what was in your mind about this? Well, I trust she's gonna explain, you know, why this, this, this different writings were con concerning, but th there's already, I've heard, you know, really a cumulative. Uh, well, Judge, I have several more journal entries, but we are gonna come in far under the four hour uh, limitation on these journals because the parts of the testimony where she's actually testified about the journals has probably been less than an hour so far in this whole time. I'm not keeping track minute by minute, but I know Mr. that- Mr. Hahn is, it's about an hour. Okay, okay. that's what I thought, about an okay. hour. So. So it's a bit I, marbled with some other things. So, but correct. Okay, it's gone let's back get to it. I, I, I don't want this jury to have to be sitting there waiting. They're out there now, 15 minutes over the time we told them to come back. So I want to right. jury. So in. is the court not going to allow me to use this line? Or I guess I'll just say, did Alex ever say to you, or did you ever yeah, say exactly. your soft you flesh became chained? Sure. Will you let me do that? Yep. Okay, that's fine. Okay, let's bring the jury in. I'm sorry. I think the court has ruled, Mr. DeFore, that I can ask that one question about that line. It did give me a chance to object, and I'm going to object to it. Okay, your objection is noted. I'm gonna, but that's the ruling on that issue. It's not able to put in that particular segment. Where's the orange notebook? Okay, I see that. Let's see Where's extra scriber? Can I have that, please? You tell me what you want, and I'll hand it to you. Well, let's keep them packaged together because they are evidence. So, so keep it. With the, yeah, keep it with the packaging. Okay. Why don't you just keep them here, and when you need something, I'll give it. To you. you tell me what you need, and I'll give it. To you. All right. And then give it back to you. And Ms. Fisher, you may continue. Thank you. Um, Ms. McCandless, you have referred to 
some essays from a book called Personal Notes and Research Ideas of the Quest to Understand. Right? Yes. And <laughs> okay. um, I inadvertently, I didn't realize that the original was not in evidence. So I'm showing you what's been marked. Oops, is it Exhibit 698? Uh, yes. Is that the orange notebook that contains those essays you've testified about? Yes. Thank no you. No objection to its admission, Your Honor. All right. And what's that exhibit 698? Yes. Okay. Okay. Exhibit 698 will be received. Again, subject to uh, court's pretrial rulings. Now, I'm also been showing you what was previously marked as number, I believe, 653. I just want to make sure. And. This is a copy of the book, the original of the book called Extra Scriber. Yes. I'm going to ask you to please turn to page 32 in this book. Or maybe I'll do it for you just to make it. Mm -hmm. So first of all, are there page numbers at the bottom of each page? Yes. All right. Um, on page 32, do you see a doodle at the bottom of that page? Yes. What is that doodle? Sorry. Um, this doodle is a dog. Okay. Who drew it? I did. Do you remember when you drew it? <coughs> yes. Can you tell the jury when you drew it? I drew it when we were together sharing a cup of coffee, and he was writing, and I was reading as he was writing. All right. And then turning to page 41 in the journal, is there a doodle at the bottom of page 41? Yes. And when did you doodle that? I doodled this when we were together yet again, and it's a bug of sorts. All right. And then turning to page 181, <coughs> at the bottom of page 181, is there another doodle? Yes, there is. And when did you doodle that? I did this yet again when we were spending time together and he was explaining to me and we were talking back and forth about this essay. Okay, thank you. I don't have any further questions about your doodles. Thank you. An extra scriber. take a look at that for a little bit. I need to be sure because fortunately No, actually, we didn't count. Uh, defense did, but. Oh, well, it's in evidence. I, perhaps I right. misspoke and I apologize. Okay. All right. I'm showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 651. Is this another journal of yes. Al Alex Woodworth? Yes. And just, just what's the name of that journal? This journal, it's notes. October 19th, 2017 through Dream tea, Tree, Simple and Elegant. And turning to the first page, is there a doodle at the bottom of that page? Yes. Did you draw that? Yes. Do it's you a, remember when you drew it? Yes, I remember when he asked me to read this and I drew a pumpkin with some hearts. Uh, uh, page 25. Is there a doodle on page 25? Yes, a cat. All right, page 27. Is there a doodle on page 27? Yes, a doodle of a peach. Page 32. Yes, this is a fox. And page 35? Yes, there's a doodle. 
All right. And were all of those doodles drawn when you were with Alex Woodworth? At times he was talking about the pages on the journal? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what was previously marked as exhibit number 654. Oh, we almost on it? Okay. I'm going to show you this book. Let me try and get the whole book in. Oops. Bearing in mind that I'm not great at this. Okay. Okay, I've been showing you what's been previously been marked, I think, as exhibit number 654. Yes. Um, what is this? Susan Kierkegaard, Fear and Trembling. Um, this particular book, did Alex discuss this book with you much? We discussed it often and we s discussed it the most during very intimate moments of our relationship. I want you to explain to the jury what you mean by him discussing them during intimate moments in your relationship. This book was the book he would read from as we were having sex and he would read passages from this book. Was there another book he also read passages from when you were engaged in sex with Alex? Yes, he would read from Caputo. Hope. Do, do you know what the name of that book is? Hoping Against Hope. talking about Alex referring to you as boy a little bit earlier? Yes. Did he also write about that in his journals? He did, yes. And I'm going to show you an essay from his journals. That's one minute. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get the right part. All right. Boy, and I'm going to show you a journal entry and ask you what the name of that entry is. Yes. When I lost myself, November 29th through 30th, 2017. Is it fair to say this is a pretty long essay? Yes. Okay. And is uh, have you looked at the handwritten compared to the typed, and are they the same? Yes, I have. How many type pages are there in this essay? I guess I should ask you that first before yes. I go to it. There are 31 typed pages. Do you mean there are five type pages? Number 20. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is that a mistake? I was reading the bottom number okay. instead of counting, but there are five. Okay. I'm not going to go through this whole essay with you. Yes. Um, I just want to ask you one thing that's in the essay. Okay. On the second to last page, or page four of the type version of the essay, can you please read that? Yes. I do not mean to stay to say that he is irrational for not running away with me. Rather, I mean his hopes for a potential. I failed to understand his love for an abusive partner, at least in ways specifically understand the desire for stability. All the more so because of his friendships are mediated by this relationship. 
To give up his current partner is to risk losing his friends. Furthermore, I understand his feelings of guilt. Guilty. This issue is my lack of sympathy. I do not see what there is to feel guilty about. He cannot do as he wants, and thus there is no love. If he did as he wanted, even without doing evil, the relationship would end. There is no love. Love is not happening, and yet he loves. I do not understand, but still I hope to be understanding. Did Alex Woodward discuss this journal entry with you? Yes. And that particular part which is referenced, what did he say to you about that? Well, when he was writing this very long journal, he pointed this out that he had been writing about me, and I noticed that instead of saying as you might, she or her, he was saying my masculine pronoun, his, him. He was talking about kind of his desires for our relationship and how he desired for my other relationship to end. And I think, all right, I'll do that later. Was there a particular phrase that Alex, a philosophical phrase that Alex frequently used? Yes, he would often say to me, love and do as you will. And in your mind? Yes. What, in your mind, well first let me ask you this, what did Alex say that that meant to him? He said to me, in what I took from what we talked about, that this love and do as you will was a way to say, I will do what I want, I will love who I want, I will do what I need to do in love. And that essentially is he will take what he wants. Okay. I'm showing you an essay about love and do what you will. What is it called? Dilige et quad vis fact. Do you know what language that is? I believe it's French. Okay. Regardless of what language it is, because I don't know, um, do you know what it translates to? Love and do as you will. All right. What's the date that this essay was written? November 9th, 2017. By this time, and is it the same as the type handwritten version? Yes. All right. By this time, was your sexual relationship with Alex, um, had you had sexual intercourse by this time? Yes, we had had sexual intercourse by that time. Okay. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to ask you to read the whole essay. Yes. Um, but I'm going to ask specifically about this third paragraph and where it says, please forgive me. Okay, can you read that part, That just those two sentences? Yes, please forgive me for moving like you. You who are so alive. I profane the very breaths I take and undead hoping to pass for something other than conscious, cor than a conscious corpse. My guilt is wanting love without having a heart. And the next sentence? I've half-heartedly tried to isolate myself from you, afraid I would taint you. Okay, and then on, I'm gonna move down. I'm going to move down to the end of the page. Okay, I'm off the screen. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm going to get it on the screen because when I look down, it looks like it's on the screen, but it's not. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, this last paragraph. Can you read that? Yes. I was further contaminated, this all mutated. 
I wanted to be happy, but felt unworthy. I wanted to be loved, but refused to believe it possible. I wanted to be alive, but lacked a heart. And you hurt me. I hated myself through you, and you were a living death. Everything I said came to be a lie. I had to escape the monster I became with you. You did not deserve it, nor did I. Do you, did Alex talk to you about what he's referring to when he says I had to become the monster, I had to escape the monster I became with you? Yes. What is that? In this conversation, we discussed how he felt, how we were continuing our relationship sexually, intimately, how he wearing the masks to everyone else. And what do you mean by masks? And you, you just explain that. Wearing the masks as to seem a certain way with everyone, let's say out in public, but underneath the mask, there was a lot hidden. All right, I'm gonna ask you about one other line in this essay. This is near the end of the essay. Yes. And again, we're not gonna read the whole thing, but I just would ask you to read the top sentence. I am, I am still afraid of myself, afraid I will come out again and hurt someone. Now, when he said that, did you discuss what he meant by he was afraid he would come out and hurt someone? Yes. Okay. And continuing with that paragraph. No, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Nelson wants to say something. Why don't you tell the jury what he said to you about him saying he was afraid he would come out and hurt someone? What he said to me about this in our discussion is he said to me how he was afraid he was going to take all. He was going to be greedy in the sense that he was, if he wanted something, he was going to get what he wanted. I'm going to refer you back to an earlier part of the essay, more in the beginning, that I forgot to read you, or yes. forgot to ask you to read. Yes. Um, so let me just make sure I have that on there, where it says, I've half-heartedly. Yes. I've half-heartedly tried to isolate myself from you, afraid I would taint you, yet I love you. I am sorry for this failure on my part. I know my touch would kill you, yet I reach out. That is my sin, the violence of my flesh that I lack a soul to correct. Uh, okay, now did he discuss that with you specifically? Yes. What did he tell you about that? What he told me about this is that in our relationship, I expressed a lot of my anxieties and my uncertainties with my previous relationship, continuing relationship with Jason. He was expressing to me that he knew it was causing me anxiety to pursue this, to keep pursuing this relationship and what we were doing. And he told me that at this point it was that he didn't really necessarily care anymore that he was causing this anxiety, that he was going to reach out anyways to me, that he was going to continue our relationship because that's what he wanted. Now, did there come a time where Alex cut his wrist? Yes. Um, can you tell the jury about that? There had been a time when I received some messages from Alex saying that he had harmed himself. I was, he was asking me if I could drive him to a pharmacy or to help him out with this. And Jason at the time was, he asked me about it and I told him Alex was hurt and Jason wanted to help. So I had gone over to Alex's house to help him and that is when I seen what had happened and Jason had patched him up as he said. When you say you saw what had happened, can you please describe that to the jury? What I saw had, had happened was he had slit his wrist and he shown me that he had to use a t-shirt to kind of stifle the bleeding. And it was just a very ugly gash from what I looked at. 
At a later date, did Alex tell you, first of all, at that time, when you were there with Jason, did he say, if you remember, yes. what he said about cutting his wrist? What he said to me about cutting his wrist is that he felt he was feeling depressed again and that he felt like he was feeling dead inside. Did he tell you that in front of Jason or did he tell you that at a later date? He told me that not in front of Jason, but kind of to the side. He pulled me to the side when we were talking. And again, I'm showing you another essay by Alex Woodworth from exhibit number six. Ninety-seven. What is this essay called? This essay is called Between Two Hands, January 20th through 22nd, 2018. Is it the same as the handwritten version, the typed version? Yes. Is this in evidence? Yes. Already? Okay. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Exhibit 697, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> and again, I'm going to ask you to read a small portion of this larger essay. Um, and I would ask you just the second paragraph, can you read that? Yes. Should I confess that I have a large gas gash on my left wrist, a self-inflicted wound that had severed nerves and nearly cut through tendons? For me, one hand can only feel and move in a limp, numb way. Okay, what I'm gonna stop you. Did yes. he? Did he discuss this essay with you? Yes, definitely. Did he, did he literally mean that his left hand couldn't move anymore? He could move it, he just said it felt different. Okay, and is he referring in this essay, did he tell you that he was writing about the time where he had cut his wrist? Yes. And he specifically, what did he specifically later tell you about cutting his wrist? He told me he had done it kind of in a, a, a painful response to my rejection. Um, later on in this essay, after he says limp, numb way, can we just go to um, one, one where it hand, says one of my hands? Yeah, we have one of my hands has quit its status almost as lib as corpse proper. It is no longer proper. It is a shameful and an advertising of my own lack of well-being. The reversibility of hands is gone. For me, one hand cannot feel. It is inactive, but it cannot be felt either. It is unpassive. I love you. What, does it say I love you, Ted? Yes, but. Do you know what Ted refers There's to? There's no Ted, no. Okay. Um, and let me ask you um, again, when he talks about this hand being unfeeling, is he referring to this physically or psychologically at this point, in, in terms of if he discussed it with you? When he discussed it with me, he said it felt different, but he was discussing how psychologically it felt numb and strange to him. Did Alex have some pet names or references he would call you besides boy? Yes. Um, what were those? His pet names for me mostly were his lamb. He would call me his son, as in S-U-N. And lamb, son, and his goon at times. All right, let me talk to you specifically about lamb. Yes. What did he tell you he meant by his lamb? As we were intimate, he would tell me, and as he would call me his lamb, he would use it in the holy sacrificial way as the lamb of Christ or the lamb of God. He would tell me I was his holy sacrifice. I was his lamb. Did that have a specific reference, his lamb, in relationship to what's shown on the cover of the Kierkegaard book? Did he say that to you? Yes, we discussed this deeply. Um, the sacrifice that, or what is shown on the book is the story of Abraham and his struggle as he was called to sacrifice 
his son, which he had an ultimate love for. And he would discuss to me the beauty and everything that was in the lines and in between the lines for him for that novel, as he would read it to me during intercourse. And was there a specific comparison between the lamb that yes. Abraham substitutes for his son and calling you the lamb? Yes. Can you explain what that is? As he would say to me that Abraham, the sacrifice of the son is a sacrifice to God, the holiness of it. And he considered me his lamb, his holy sacrifice, and all of the love in that, and the sacrifice of not wanting to give that up. He also used the word son, S-U-N. Was yes. he referring to anything specific when he told you he was, you were his son? Yes, he had a pet name for... And, I know and this is embarrassing. So. It, it, this is embarrassing for me. Um, it's in reference to my v vagina. It, the sun, the blaze, the warmth. He would often talk about how my intimate area was his sun, S-U-N. Now, during this time, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to take you up now to... Um, first of all, are there many journal phrases where Alex would refer to love and do what you will? Yes. Did you take the journals and count up what you thought, how many times that he would actually refer to that phrase in his journals? Yes. How many times did you count? Roughly, it was the high 20s into the 30s. It's, it's deeply woven into the journals. Was that phrase also deeply woven into your relationship? Yes. It seemed like instead of your typical morning text message, it would be a text of love and do as you will. Or he would somehow bring it into almost every conversation we would have. Intimately, just normal conversation at the coffee shop, at home. It was, it was always a part of every day. I'm going to ask you um, about some specific sexual acts between you and Alex, all right? All right. As your sexual relationship progressed into January and February, yes. did the sexual acts between you and Alex undergo a change from what they had been? Yes. Can you please tell us what that was? Well, from what I said before, the more vanilla, it turned into a, what at times could be considered a BDSM relationship. And what does BDSM mean? BDSM is bind, dominance, and it can be submissive or sadomasochist. It's, it depends on what sector you're in, if it's submissive, dominant, or sadomasochism. Okay, I'm going to ask you this with respect to Alex, okay? Yes. Have you heard, in respect to BDSM, what a safe word is? Yes. What is a safe word? In a BDSM relationship, a safe word is essentially, it's one of the most important parts of the relationship, I consider. It's when... In an act, when something is getting too much for you or one of the partners or the submissive, and a safe word is something that individual can say when it's just too much and it's time to stop. In sexuality, first of all, with regard to Alex, what role did you play, the dominant or the submissive? I took the role of submissive. And in that role, did Alex and you have a safe word? I suggested it, but we did not agree, and we did not have a safe word, no. Why didn't you agree? What did Alex tell you with respect to ha not having a safe word? He didn't prefer a safe word. He, f he told me in our relationship that it didn't, he didn't want that, essentially. It didn't 
play into kind of what he wanted to get out of the relationship. And I'm going to ask you about some specific sexual acts. First of all, I'm going to ask you about wax or what's called wax play. Wax play is when you use a candle, like a candle or a wax like substance and you drip or drain it on to your partner, the submissive. Before you referred to prone, and we only discussed prone in terms of you being face down, was there another aspect to what was called prone that eventually developed in your sexual relationship with Alex? What eventually developed with this prone position is the desire for the submissive in this role to be in a, what is commonly called a chokehold or to, to appear to be unconscious. Did, was that something he did with you? Yes. Um, let me ask you, how is it that without a safe word, in your mind, did this connect at all with what Alex used to say to you about your flaws and vulnerability? Yes. Can you please explain that to us? With, without a, in an act like this, or in an asexual act, without a safe word, it, it is hard for me as an individual to be vulnerable. I was uncomfortable with the idea of no safe word, and he demanded from me to be vulnerable in these times, and that was hard for me. In addition to the wax and the chokehold thing you described, was there ever a time back in your relationship in January or February where Alex used a knife when having sex with you? Yes, he had cut a pair of my pants that I had one day. It never went as far to touch or graze my skin. He just ripped through some holes that were already on my pants. And I just, I threw them away after that. What was your reaction to these things? The wax, the chokehold, the knife, that one occasion. Um, what was your reaction to these? My reaction, I was very supportive of his dominance at first. I wanted him to feel like he can express himself. And I was also exploring. With the wax, it, it was different and it was a bit strange for me at first, but that it was fine. I found I had issues with the prone position and being in a chokehold from behind. I started to not enjoy that. It was really just not what I wanted. And I had voiced my opinion a few times. It was just, it wasn't with my alignment. The time he had cut my pants, he ripped through some holes already and he cut them. And I was a bit frustrated at the sense that, oh great, I have to throw some pants away now. But it made me a bit uncomfortable because it was so sudden and so new. Well, let me just take you back to something you said because I want to follow up. You said you voiced your opinion? Yes. What did you say to him when you voiced your opinion? When I voiced my opinion to him, I said to him, essentially in this prone position or in this position that I was sore, that at times it was uncomfortable and it felt as if it was a bit bruising and constricting for me. It caused anxiety. When you told him that you didn't like it, yes. how did he respond to you? Well, it was quite crude how he responded, but he would tell me that it wasn't fair that I had finished and he wasn't going to get his chance then. So you're telling him you don't like this, to not do it. He's saying it's unfair, I didn't get to finish. What would happen as a, you know, either during, after, before those conversations? During the conversation, he would express how he was, he thought it was unfair he didn't get to finish because he spent so much time for me. And I, I would just essentially not completely shut down, but just say all right and just let let it go, just let it happen. So you would let him complete what he yes, wanted to do? Yes, yes. Even when you didn't feel like it? Yes. Okay. 
I'm showing you from Exhibit 697 an essay called the Twitter. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we will resume right where we left off. And Julie Grant will be here. Roger for TV Live. Watching Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. Thank you for being here on this Monday. And what a day to be joining us as Ezra McCandless is testifying in her own defense in her murder trial in the state of Wisconsin. Let's go back in together, and we promise you haven't missed a minute. The date on that? December 3rd, 2017. Is the type version the same as the handwritten? Yes. This essay, does it begin with him talking about love and do as you will? Yes. And as this essay continues, does he talk about love and do as you will? I'm not gonna have you read it, but is there a continued discussion about what it means? Yes. Does he specifically um, mention there is love and do as you will. Don't worry about self-control. Be excessive if you want to. There is nothing you ought to do. Anything goes. Yes. Did he discuss that with you? Yes. What did he mean by that? What he meant by that, because there's the original love and do as you will, but when he says it, it was his way of it saying, this is what I mean when I say this to you. This is what I mean when I say love and do as you will. So in other words, in your intimate relationship with Alex, would he express a divergence from the philosophical love as you do with Will to the personal love and do as you will? Yes. Sustained leading. Okay, what did he express about how love and do as you will meant to him personally in your relationship? What he told me in our relationship is that there is going to be times when he's going to take control. He's going, if he, there's going to be times when he's demanding certain things and love and do as you will, as he would say, is the reason why he's able to do this because he will do as he will. It, it was his way of saying, I'm going to do this and love and do as you will, he would say. I'm showing you the sentence that's near the very end of this essay on the page that begins with the, mere, the word merely. Yes. Can you please read that sentence? Merely doing as one will sexually makes consent irrelevant, but merely letting another do as they will does the same. All right. This issue about consent being irrelevant by doing as he would. Yes. Were you aware of this sentence in his journals before the sexual acts became, in January and February, things you were uncomfortable with? Yes, it was a conversation we had in detail. And how did you feel about this line about consent being irrelevant? Well, as I was reading this essay and we're discussing, yet again, love and do as you will, I pointed it out and I told him that I felt completely the opposite of this. I come from a point of when consent is everything, like consent, 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 each step of the way. And this for me was a first red flag. I'm showing you a very short essay Yes. Called Resolution, written on January 1st, 2108. Yes, I'm familiar. Okay. And is the typed version the same as the handwritten version? Yes. All right. Can you read that essay? I need to be. I need to be more selfish. My relationships have failed because I couldn't ask for what I wanted or needed. I love people who are hurting, but I am too. To find anything that will last, I need to find a way to be selfish. Oddly, I need to find resol resoluteness. Re resoluteness in this resolution. Selfishness needs to find a place in my values. So as he started to take and do what he wanted sexually, yes, and you were protesting 
Yes. Did you think about this essay where he had said this at all? Yes, I had. I, I thought about it often. And I'm going to show you one last essay now, and um, I think we're going to be done with the essays okay. at that point. Um, if just one second, I'm trying to find the right thing rather than read the entire essay. showing you, again, another essay. What's the title of this essay? The title of this essay is Faith in Flesh, February 2nd, 2018. And again, is the typed version the same as the handwritten version? Yes. And I'm going to ask you about a specific paragraph that's kind of in the middle of this essay. Can you read this paragraph? Yes. Next, the other may demand that I not die. They may demand that I not commit self-sacrifice. This may be because they enjoy my self-mutilation or, be beca or because they refuse to carry the guilty of my guilty flesh. In both cases, my duty is to feed is complicated. For to give purely is suicide. For to give purely is suicide, go ahead. Violence against another to provide for this demanding okay, wait, other. I'm sorry, I think Did I miss a sentence? Wait, one minute. For to give purely to suicide <laughs> can, involve, <laughs> can involve a cessation of violence, but it is the obligation to not die oddly, I must commit violence against another to provide for this demanding other. This forces me to murder. In order to provide, I am doing it either way. This is demanding, this demanding other has taken my redeeming suicide from me and doomed me to torturous guilty. Okay. So when you saw that Alex had written about murder in his journal, did this stand out to you in any way? Yes, this essay did stand out to me. Okay, I'll ask you more about that later. I'm going to go back to talking to you about um, Jason. All right. All right. Yes. Um, this relationship's developing with Alex. Yes. And as this is going on, what's going on with you and Jason? As our relationship with Alex and I developed, the rift between me and Jason in the distance furthered. We, it seemed as if we were more roommates and just living together than we were girlfriend and boyfriend anymore. What were you thinking about doing with respect to your relationship with Jason? I was thinking about leaving, ending it, breaking up. Now, you heard Jenna Van Zant testify before? Yes. And I believe that I'm showing you what's been marked previously as exhibit number 405 and entered in evidence. Is this a copy of texts that went between you and Jenna Van Zant? Yes. Um, and what did you say to Jenna Van Zant in that text? Would you like me to read it exactly? Um, or you can summarize it or read it either way. In summary, I was expressing that I needed more boundaries, that I was feeling mistreated, and I, the relationship was unhealthy, there was no communication, miscommunications, and that I, I, I need to talk to him about these things and I might need to leave. Well, in the beginning, you say, 
I'm realizing I'm finally brave enough to talk to Jason. Yes. To talk. Did you also refer in this to breaking up with him? Yes. Yes. And did you talk about how other people were telling you about your relationship with Jason? Yes, a lot of my friendships I had at Racy's, I would tell them examples and things that were going on between me and Jason. And my friends at the time, they were telling me that this is unhealthy and damaging and you need to get out of this. Um, did you talk about him specifically name calling you? Yes, he had called me names. In this, I said specifically, he called me retard, retarded, one of the most offensive things to me. Okay. Now, on this day, on February 5th, was this right before you, in fact, did break up with Jason? I believe so, yes. I'm just gonna briefly diverge. All right. Into something else. Um, well, let me just say this. Eventually, did you also break up with Alex? Yes. Did you break up with the two of them in the same month? Yes. So which breakup was first? Jason. And how long after breaking up with Jason, did approximately how long, I know you don't have a calendar, did you break up with Alex? Not long after, a few weeks or so, maybe a month. During this time, did you, did you also spend some time with a fellow named John Hansen? Yes, I had. How did you know him? He was my friend through Jason. And being your friend through Jason, did you have any interest in John Hansen? Yes, at the time I did have some interest in John Hansen. Would the word crush express that, or what word would you use? I had developed a crush, yes. When Jason went out of town, well, so you were spending some time with John Hansen. Um, did you know of a friendship between John Hansen and Alex as well? I was well aware of their friendship, yes. And Phyllis, did they discuss philosophies as far as you knew? Yes, they discussed philosophy all of the time. Um, do you know if specifically they discussed a philosophy called nihilism? Yes. Section relevance. Overruled. Go ahead. Did they? Okay, go ahead. Yes, that was a topic all three of us had discussed together all the time. And when discussing nihilism, what did Alex Woodworth say that it meant to him? What Alex Woodworth expressed to me about nihilism is that it's a kind of take all. It's a going against the norms of society and it's a very, in a lot of ways, it's kind of a pe pessimistic nihilism. It's a very different view of life than I had at the time. What about John? Did he express similar things to you? Objection, yeah. relevance. I'm going to sustain that. Uh, it, again, it's what's in Ms. McCandless, it's in her mind. Uh, so sustain on that. Now, when Jason went out of town, um, John Hansen and you, had you done some drawings, paintings, or anything like that? Yes, we had been hanging out quite a bit, doing art together. When Jason went out of town, did something happen with you and John Hansen? Yes. What happened? What happened between me and John is that he bought some wine for us, and I had gone over to his house to talk about what's going on between me and Jason, and... Alex and what's really going on and I hadn't really eaten anything that day and I started to drink a lot of wine and I had ultimately become severely drunk to the point of throwing up and blacking out a few times. Did you, so is it fair for me to say when you say blacking out a few times, do you mean that you were in and out of consciousness? Yes. Does it also mean that you have a hard time recovering some of what happened that evening? Yes. Is there something specific sexually, though, that you do recall about that evening? Yes. What is that? Specifically, I remember it being dark and w w waking up, and I could 
clearly feel that I was in a sexual act, that I, some, someone was having sex with me. Did you know who that person was? Yes, it was John. The next day, did John, um, so let me ask you this, this sexual act, did you resist him at all? No, I just let it happen. The next day, uh, in the morning, what happened? In the morning, he told me to go to his son's room and wait until he got up so that his roommate wouldn't suspect that I was in his bed. And Did you eventually go back home? Yes, we, he drove me back to my apartment. When he drove you back to your apartment, did he come in? Yes, he did. And um, what happened once you were inside the apartment? Once we were inside the apartment, he had said that he had to go to the bathroom. So I went upstairs to change out of my clothes from the night before, and he came into my room with me. And <sighs> this is hard. <laughs> Um, he just started undoing his belt and said that I looked great and that proceeded to ask me and lead me to perform sexual acts with him. And again, did you resist him at all? No. Did you tell him, no, I don't want to do this? I didn't say much of anything, so no, I did not. Now, after that incident with John Hansen, was it shortly after that that you left Jason's apartment and broke up with Jason? Yes. Where did you move when you left his apartment? I moved to my mother's. Who helped you move? <coughs> Alex helped me move. Had you previously introduced Alex to your family, or at least to your mother? A few times he met my family, yes, at Racy's. And had Alex also uh, come over to the office that your mom worked in one time? Yes, I invited him to come help peel some wallpaper from the office. When Alex came over to your families, did even after helping you move back home, was he invited back another occasion? Yes. And who did he spend time with on that occasion? On that occasion, he spent time with me and my mother. Anybody else? Yes. Who? My sister and my dad, my stepdad. And what's your stepdad's name? James Gunnelson. Okay. Um, after you moved out, were you still seeing Jason at all? Well, first of all, when you moved out, was Jason in town or out of town? He was out of town. And um, were you still seeing him at all? Was he still your boyfriend? He wasn't my boyfriend, no, but... We were still texting. Things were confusing between us. During this period, how did Jason come to know about John Hansen? Or did he come to know is, I guess, what I should say? He did, yes. How, do you know how he came to know about it? I do know. He had wanted to spend some time with me in Eau Claire, so he rented a hotel room for us. And after a night together, I woke up to him going through my phone. And there had been some text messages. Well, just, I just want to back up there a second. When you say your phone, was it actually a phone or a different device? No, I never use a real phone. I always use an iPod, which I've been using for a while when I'm connected to Wi-Fi. So I'm pretty disconnected otherwise. Okay. And... Um, in fact, there was a phone found in your car on yes. March, after March 22nd when the police found that. Was that phone functional? Um, I don't know because I never paid the bill. I got it for just a little while for work, and then I just stopped using it altogether. So it ran out of minutes, of course, so no, it was not functional. Okay. Let me get back to this whole issue about Jason going through your iPod. Um, what did ha what happened when he went through your iPod? When he had gone through my iPod, there was a few text messages that were flirtatious between me and John that I had not deleted. Jason woke me up, and he had screenshotted my text messages. He was pretty angry, and he even broke my iPod in this anger. And when he broke your iPod during this anger, did he do anything else to you? Yes, during this conversation we were having, a little argument, he 
threw my iPod to the floor after reading these text messages to me. He pushed me down on the bed and told me I couldn't leave until this was resolved. What Did Jason place a phone call to anyone? Yes, he had called John. During this conversation, were you able to hear the entire conversation? I was right with him the entire time. Were you asked to talk to John during this conversation? Yes. Who asked you to do that? Jason asked me to speak with John. And did uh, Jason say something to John about having sex with you? Yes, he asked him if I, he had had sex with me, and John responded that he had not. Um, and why did, do you know why Jason made you talk to John on the phone? He made me speak with John on the phone that he, so he could li so that he could listen to our conversation and see if he would change his story. And during that conversation, did John acknowledge that he had had sex with you? Yes. And had you acknowledged that to Jason? Yes. When you talked to Jason about this, yes. John having sex with you, um, yes. Did you express at all that you thought it was a rape, or did you ever use that word? No. Did you ever use the word? Why don't you me have some water? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's... Okay, why don't we just hang on just a second? Of course. <clears throat> Good. That? Okay, go ahead. Did you use the word assault when you talked to Jason? It was not a word I had used, no. Um, after you, he had talked to John on the phone, did he take you over to Josh Trankler's? Yes, he did take me to Josh Trankler's after this. Okay, who's Josh Trankler? He's a friend of ours, a friend we share, yes. Uh, what happened, let's, I just wanna make sure everybody's, okay. What happened when Jason took you over to Josh Trankler's? Well, after I had told him roughly what had happened the night between me and John, Jason got just full of rage. He was pacing and he told me he was going to do something to John, that he was gonna kill John, that we needed to go somewhere to talk to somebody with a level head. So he, take, he had taken me to Josh's house. When he got to Josh's, was Jason acting like he had a level head? No. What was he doing? Jason went upstairs with Josh and he would pace downstairs and he was just pacing all over the house. He was yelling with, at Josh essentially and he just, he, he, he was very hot headed at that time. He was very angry. When you were downstairs, could you hear him upstairs? Yes. And as a result of all of the screaming and yelling, that yes. Jason was doing, to your knowledge, did Josh, to, how did you know that, or did you know how Josh Trankler responded? Yes, I do. He called the police because he was concerned as what Jason might do to John. When the police got there, did they ask to speak to you? Yes, they did. What did you tell them? The police were directed to me by Jason and Josh to talk to them and I didn't really want to talk in this place where everybody was angry and hot-headed so they asked me if I'd like to go back to the station to talk and I said yes. Now you've been in court and you heard the tape of you talking to Officer Vang. Yes. Was everything you said on that tape true? Yes. You also heard testimony about you talking to Detective Prock. Yes. And essentially, in so many words, did you tell Detective Proc essentially the same things that you told Officer Vang about the sex with you and John? Yes. Did you ever use the word assault or rape when you were talking with Detective Vang or Detective Proc? No. Did somebody bring up the word assault or, or something similar to you? Yes. Who was that who brought that up and defined what you told them or informed you that this is an assault? Objection relevant. Sustained. I would like to approach. All right. All right, while the attorneys are at sidebar, we're going to squeeze in a quick break. We promise you won't miss a minute of Ezra McCandless' testimony in her own defense in this trial. Don't go anywhere. Court TV Live continues for you after this.
is so great to have you with us here on Court TV Live. Welcome back on this Monday. I'm Julie Grant. We are bringing you exclusive coverage of the state of Wisconsin versus defendant Ezra McCandless being accused of murdering one of her lovers. She is on the stand right now testifying in her own defense. You haven't missed a minute. Let's watch together more now. Did you inform Detective Proc when you were meeting with him that you had been flirting with John? Yes, I told him about that. Okay. And did uh, Detective Proc and Officer Fang give you some literature after you met with them? Yes. Well, after I met with Vang, there were some individuals that they provided me with a folder full of pamphlets to, to get help and counsel during a tough time like this. Did you go to counseling? Yes, I did. All right. Now, I'm going to move from talking about that to talking about um, the period of this happening. First of all, before this happened, where Jason was looking at your iPod, yes. did you break off with Alex before that occurred? Yes. Uh, was Do you remember time-wise how recent it was before Jason looked at your iPod? It was briefly before, before approximately. Like a day or two, is that what you mean yeah. by briefly? Yes. Okay. And um, so I'm going to ask you some questions now about that period between All right. um, you moving back home, breaking off with Jason, then breaking off with Alex. First of all, yes. why did you break off with Alex? Let me ask you that first. I broke off with Alex because during this time there was so much going on and he wanted my love and vulnerability and it, at that time I wasn't ready for a relationship. I felt there was just so much going on. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to work on my previous relationship yet. I wasn't ready. And during this period, were you saying, what were you doing generally with your life? Who are you, you said you were living with your mother, I believe, yes. right? And living with your mother, were you working? Or what, yes, what was I was. going on with your life? So, I moved back home with my mom and I applied to a school that I graduated from. And I started soon after working as a paraprofessional in the kindergarten through fourth grade special education room. And besides working, were you talking much with your, uh, Jason during that time? Yes, I was. What were your feelings or your thoughts about Jason during this time in March? During this time, I, Lots of feelings of love from the love we had when we first started a relationship, memories from when we first started. Just being away from him made me miss him, and I was feeling, again, a lot of that love. Were you texting about that? All of the time, yes. Was Jason reciprocating your texts? Yes. Did there, uh, in the middle of March, did you go to Eau Claire and spend any time with Jason? Yes. Just tell us about that briefly. I went and I spent some time with Jason. We had started sleeping with each other again and talking about possibly maybe getting counseling, thinking about all the things we had said to each other in the past, just seeing if maybe this really needed to work out because of how much we did love each other. And when you said you started sleeping with him, um, yes. where did you spend some time, a couple of nights with him or anything in Eau Claire? Yes, I spent a couple of nights with him. We got a few hotel rooms. We didn't really want to be at the apartment. Okay. After spending a couple of nights with Jason, do, do you recall th th what time that was? Was it like the date? Do you have any memory of what the exact dates were? I have no memory of the exact dates, no. Okay. Um, did you um, return after spending a couple of nights to Jason's to your mother's house? I did, yes. And what happened when you got back to your mom's? Well, um, m my mom wasn't supportive of me <clears throat> continuing or exploring the idea of rekindling the relationship I had with Jason. And me being her do me being her child and she was my mom we got into an argument of course i i knew what i wanted and i was she disagreed so i moved out after that 
Okay. Um, let me ask you then about going, um, so did your mom feel the same way about Alex that she felt about Jason in terms of what she expressed to you? She had some mixed feelings about Alex as well. And when you broke up with Alex, um, how did you break up with him? I regretfully broke up with him through text. Why did you do it through text? It was, I did it through text because I did it in a rushed way. I just wanted to just be done with all of this drama. Okay. We'll come back to talking about you and Alex later, but I'm going to ask you, after your mother was upset with you because yes. you were saying Jason and asked you to leave, where did you go? I went to my dad's. Um, and is that your father, Joe Shane Carlin, who we saw in court? Yes. All right. What is your father's main employment? He's a correctional officer. And besides his correctional officer primary, yes. does he have a do-it-yourself or secondary business that he owns? He has a tree-cutting business that I helped name when I was about five. Did you uh, work with him at that tree-cutting business? All of the time, yes. And when you worked with him, um, did you use knives at all? It was a part of every day. When he, um, in addition to knives and the tree-cutting service, did your father, I'm going to call him your father, he's your adoptive father. Yes, he's my father, he's okay. my dad. Um, did he give you or let you have other knives in your car? Yes, he seemed to always give me one or want me to have one in different places. There's been discussion here about the knife that um, that you used or the knife that was in your car that the police yes. found by the side of the road, the knife that was involved in the knife fight with you and Alex. And yes. was that, and how did you get that knife? Objection, Your Honor, to the characterization. Argumentative. Okay, the knife we're talking about, how yes. did you get that knife? That knife was a knife that my dad had given me. He's, he always likes to make sure I'm prepared for every situation. So various EMT knives he would give to me to break glass. It has seatbelt cutters. He just wants me to be prepared. It had been in and out of the house. He has a few of them, yes. And that particular knife, did you put it in your car on the morning of March 22nd? No. Do you know when you put it in your car? No, it was in and out always. Okay. Um, what would your dad, specifically with the use of knives, what would your father tell you about that? Objection, hearsay, sustain. A judge, it goes to her say to mine, not the truth of the matter asserted. Let, let me rephrase right. the question, maybe okay. it'll be more clear. Did your father ever say anything to you about having a knife in your car specifically um, for defending yourself? Objection, hearsay. Well, it's not offered for the truth. No. The matter is sort of just for what is in her state of mind, so Correct. I'll overrule the objection. Okay. What? Yes. Okay. What did he tell you, or what do you recall him telling you? What I recall my dad telling me, he told me many times, and he would always tell me, when you're in a situation with an individual or if someone's attacking you, that you need to do anything and everything you can to get away, to defend yourself. And he would tell me about... You can use knives, you can scratch, you can kick, you can fight. Were you aware that there were firearms in his house? Well aware. Did you know where they were located? Always, yes, he made me aware of this. Uh, were you able to have access to them? Yes. Did you learn how to use firearms when you were young? Of course, he made sure of that. Did you go hunting with your father? I never hunted, but I've gone hunting many times. Now, did you take a firearm with you when you left your father's house on the morning of March 22nd? Absolutely not. Why not? All I was doing that day was going for some errands. There was no need for a weapon or a firearm or anything of that sense. Was one of those errands that you were going to do on March 22nd, in your mind, was one of the things you wanted to do to talk to Alex? Yes. And... Um, so did you want to bring a gun with you to talk to Alex? Absolutely not. Were you afraid of Alex? No. All right. I'm going to ask you some specific uh, uh, communication that 
you had received on the evening of March 21st. Uh, were you sent a picture on Instagram by Jason? Yes, I was. Um, and that's a picture we've seen. That's an evidence of the bathroom wall. Yes, it after, is. After you received that picture, uh, what did you do? Well, I wasn't happy about it. Did you have then a voice conversation with Jason yes, I in did addition call him. to texting? Yep. And when you saw that picture, did you have some thoughts in your mind about who had written your phone number and, um, you know, barista or maybe some of the kitchen boys as they're called? What, what do you mean by kitchen boys? Kitchen boys, well, that's what they call the workers who work in the kitchen side of Racy Dell Lanes, which is called the nucleus. Just a bunch of guys. Like cooks, chefs? Cooks, chefs. Did you, in your mind, did you think Alex had written it? No. Um, it your was... Honor, then I'm going to object to this whole line of questioning as not being relevant. Well, the, the state brought this in for some reason. I think her state of mind about yeah, it. I'm going to overwrite. Thank you. Um, were you planning to mention it to Alex? Yes, I was. What was your intent with telling Alex about this? My intent with telling Alex about this was just to ask him, like, how do you think they got my number? It kind of sucks that this is going on. There's a lot of drama. Do you know who might be doing it? So I could ask him that this isn't right. Can you stop, please? All right. Before, in, in the period of time where... You were at home. Yes. In March. Were you writing any journals? Yes, I was. I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibit number 365. Yes. And what's the title of that journal? This journal is Ezra McCandless, Silence Broken. I'm also showing you what's been marked as 366. Is there a title on that journal? There's no title, but it's called Journal 2. Okay. Over what period of time were you writing these two journals? It was a period of a couple weeks. I had been visiting someone for counseling, and they told me maybe to write Objection, down. Objection, hearsay. Sustained. Why were you writing the journals? to express how I felt oh. about everything. And were you doing it specifically because you were trying to have this be part of the therapeutic process for you? Yes. All right, so there's been some testimony about these journals being edited on March 21st. Yes. Did you open the journals? On March 21st? Yes, think? over the period of weeks, I had finished it a couple weeks before, but as a writer, you always open it to correct misspellings, alignment of paragraphs. Every time I open it, it adds that it's been seen or edited. Was this journal in a format called Google Docs? Yes. And in Google Docs, every time you open a document, does it update the date? <coughs> it does, yes. OK. Um, did you? Uh, You've reviewed these journals, right? Of course, yes. And were you going to send them to a friend named Julia Post? Yes, I had sent them to her already. And what was the purpose of doing that? The reason why I spent time with a few weeks before and why I had sent them to her is she's, she's great with grammar and she's great with words, so she was helping me out. She was kind of my consult for cleaning it up. Okay, I'm going to put this now on the Elmo. We're not going to read everything, but I'm just going to ask you in this journal what you're talking about and why, just in summary form. All right. So just to summarize, this part of the journal, when you're talking about moving uh, back, it was the past summer and you had moved. Had you been, where had you been before the summer you moved back with your parents? The summer before I moved back with my parents was spent in Marinette, Wisconsin, and that's where I was starting my first year of secondary school. Okay, so after your first year of, so secondary school for you, does that mean, are you referring to college? Yes. Okay, just some people call secondary school high school, so I just that's wanted true. to clarify college. that. Okay, and so after your first year of college, um, are you telling us you had gone back home? Yes, I am. All right. Now, when you went back home, did you uh, did you then write in your journal about your relationship with uh, 
Jason Mangle. Yes, I did. Um, you used this sentence, months have passed between us and love had grown. It's an ancient love so powerful, it often scared both of us. I became sick and had the suspicion of what it could be. So what do you mean when you're writing in those passages? What I mean by, as I said in there, an ancient love so powerful. Many times between me and Jason, our own philosophical discussions, we talk about past loves, being old spirit. We, can, we both consider ourselves, even though I'm young, to be very, very old spirits. So, is that that expression people use sometimes? Oh, he or she's an old soul. Yeah, all the time. Okay. All the time. He would describe me as his old soul. So, as saying that this love, this passion, this love, it was just we felt so much love and so much in common with each other right away that that's just how I express that. In the essay, did you go on to talk about your abortion? Yes, I had. Um, and did you express how the abortion impacted your relationship with Jason Mango? I expressed how it impacted us greatly, yes. Okay. And did you then write in this journal about after, you said in this journal that you became, I think the word is, a husk of a woman. Yes. And what did you mean by that? What I meant by that is after the operation and after everything that had happened, I felt just so, I felt like a part of myself had been taken away. I felt hollow inside. You then start talking about two individuals invading your empty mind, yes. dragging you down a rabbit hole, told what ideas to follow, masks you should wear. Can you explain what you meant when you wrote about that? Yes. So during this incredible, vulnerable time when I had terminated my pregnancy, my the two dominant voices I'm speaking of here are friends, were friends, Alex and John Hansen. I was talking about in this how during my vulnerable t state, I was being told kind of how to feel, how to get over things, what to do, just kind of how to, I describe it as a mask, just kind of how to move past this in ways they thought might help or what I should do, they thought. So this is your feelings then, but as you were going through this, you, you talked about developing feelings of love for Alex. Yes. So in here you're expressing it completely differently. Yes. Why the difference? The difference is coming out of the relationship. I, I don't want you to look at this. I just okay. want you to talk about how you felt. All right. So coming out of the relationship, I, in that relationship, I felt all of this love and this warmth and listening to him and him telling me what I should do and what I should think, essentially. In that moment, all I felt was that love. I was only, that's all I was, I could notice. And then being completely removed from a relationship and from that relationship, I noticed all of the red flags or things that really didn't fit right with me and that... It's opposite now because I'm expressing what I had, I had ignored because right. of love. Let me ask you this. Okay? Yes. Um, in this, it's yes. happening on the screen. You you wrote, I was an object even called a fetish, Can, and that it horrified you to be described as a fetish. Can you tell me what you mean by that? What I meant by that in this essay or journal, as you can call it, was that. The person I had loved at that time were, uh, in instead of just being me and wanting to be seen as me, they started to express how I was a fetish to them, how, how I identified, how I looked, what they wanted from me. Instead of essentially being, as a mechanicalist, the person, I was just the want, the fetish, the sexual aspects. Is that how you felt at that time in your relationship with Alex? Yes. And um, you talk about what happened with John and vomiting and yes. fears. Um, and then you also then talked to that you had turned to your other friend for advice and concerns. Yes. And what do you mean by that, you would turn to your other friend? What were you writing about? 
I had talked about in there turning to my other friend being Alex about what had happened between me and John. And you said that when you turned to Alex, um, you wrote, to, you said, guilt towards our friendship only to once again for it to turn to his desires of making me the boy he wanted. What did you mean by that? When what had happened between me and John had happened, I quickly, shortly after I went to go talk to Alex, I told him my fears about what had happened, the confusion, the kind of the betrayal aspect of it. And during that time when I went over to his house to see him, he just kind of told me, well, I can make you forget it. You can sleep with me. We can spend some time together. Let me make you forget. What you wrote in your journal after that was, quote, it was painful, and I often said stop. Yes. I can't, and then you wrote bit, but I think you mean but, but he would then yes. change the position and proceed to say I'm fine and just too sensitive. Earlier you talked about your sex with Alex talking about your fine. Yes. That he should finish. Is that what you're referring to in this journal? Yes. And I was referring to, yes, the sensitive feeling bruised. I was referring to that, yes. And at the end of the journal, you have a section called What is Next? Yes. If, what are you talking about in the What is Next section? Do you need me to put it up on the screen for you to refresh your memory? Sure. Okay. All right, let's just put that section. Okay, so just again, I don't want you to read the whole thing, but. I'm refreshed, yes. Okay, so let me ask you this. When you're, when you're talking about this in this section, about what is next, what are you talking about in this journal? What I'm talking about in this journal, in there were sections of this, in this journal going through my relationship, my loves I had had, and in this what is next is I was writing about like, what am I going to do next? What can I become? I felt that my opportunities are endless. I can keep pursuing the career I want. Just i very inspired by a conversation I had with my father and how I can take a course of action for myself. I can become who I am. When you said I betrayed the one I love in many ways and felt nothing but regret and pain knowing how far I lost myself, you put that yes. in there. Yes, I had. And were you talking about how you were going to change that, or what were you talking about? When I was talking about that, not that I was going to change the betrayal and the feelings of guilt, is that just acknowledging that this had happened. I'm not going to hide from what I had done. and. I acknowledge the fact that my partner at that time was deeply hurt, and I can recognize that and acknowledge it. You ended this with writing, I cannot hurt myself anymore. I cannot hurt the ones I love. Yes. I can become Ezra McCandless again. I am worth it. What did you mean by that? What I meant by that is there was so much going on in the past months. There was drama, there was loss, and there was pain, and there was love. And I've stepped back and I recognize all of it. I recognize that I am worth it as a person. I can be what I want to be. I can do what I want to do as in career wise, as an artist, I can just express myself and embrace that it's, it's, it's time for a change. Let me ask one thing in this journal and I'm trying to find the line. Yes. Um, and I think Mr. You, oh, you, okay. The part about what is next, you talked about being inspired by your dad. Did you write the whole paragraph, what is next, or was that just a feeling you're having? I'm a little confused. The whole paragraph at the end, what is next? Did I, you, yes, I wrote it, yes. I, I know you wrote it, but did yes. you write that whole paragraph that night? Or no, did you no, it, it was... It kind of corroborated the fact that I can do this. I am worth it. He helps me embrace that feeling more with our talks. Okay. And 
you also, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but you also yes. wrote what's called Journal 2. Yes. What's Journal 2, uh, what are you writing about in Journal 2? In Journal 2, it was mostly, it was more of a reflection of the guilt, the pain, the relationship issues I had had. It was also, it was another, it was kind of disconnecting myself from another in a relationship and looking at that, reflecting on that and how I felt about that at that time. And is that journal too much more specific to your relationship with Alex Woodward? Yes. Okay. And um, again, um, you end that with saying, I do not discount my part in the abuse. I do not feel innocent. Are you referring also with Jason, when you say I do not feel innocent, who are you referring to? I'm referring to all of it, all of it, to Jason, to all of my relationships at the time. Okay. My mother, my father. Are you feeling d d that you're taking responsibility or? Yes, very much so. I is that a theme in therapy? What was your, you yes. know, that- Yes. Objection. Sustain. Um, were you wanting during this period of time to take responsibility for your own actions? Very much so. I I didn't I wasn't running from anything I've ever done. I wasn't I was taking responsibility for my actions and even if I didn't want to look at all of the ugly parts, I was going to do it because I have a responsibility to grow as a person. And that's a big step of that. You ended that essay with, I know I can be human, I know I can be free, I know I can love, I know I can only strive to never do this again. What did you mean by that? What I meant by that is to be more aware, to be more conscious of my relationships. What I meant by that is I can be human, I can express myself, I'm not hiding and I'm not... Essentially, that was mostly about cheating and leaving someone for certain reasons. Now, after you what do you think of this testimony so far? As you know, we haven't gotten to the incident in question on March 22nd, 2018. That is yet to come. Stay right there. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're picking up exactly where we're leaving off. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Thank you for being with us for our exclusive coverage of the state of Wisconsin versus defendant Ezra McCandless being accused of murdering one of her three lovers. She says that it was in self-defense. She took the stand. She's on the stand still on direct examination. We're picking up right where we left off. Let's watch more together now. Not sure what's going on there. We're having, obviously, a technical difficulty. We apologize for that. We're going to get you back into the courtroom as soon as we are able. Uh, but she's still on the stand, still on direct, and been on the stand for over three hours now, but still hasn't spoken about the date in question, March 22nd, 2018. All right, that issue is fixed. Let's take you into the courtroom together live. And I think... Um did there come a time where something interrupted that conversation? Yes. All right. Um, Judge, do you want to take a lunch break now? Or? Well, I'm just kind of waiting to hear whether there's food. I'd like to go up until uh, we're ready for the jury. We don't, we don't have any word yet. So as oh. soon as we get word, okay. uh, we're going to break here real soon. All right. All right. I asked you about an interruption. and I, Yes. I am... And you said there was an interruption. What, yes. what did you hear that made you realize there was, that somebody else was there? What well, made me realize someone else was there is that I heard a ringtone very loudly, not far outside of the room we were in. I was, like, surprised by that, kind of taken back. I think I forgot to ask you this. Had you left, what had you done with your car when you had gotten over to Alex's house? I left it running. Why? I often leave my car running because it's, uh, I don't, take care of my car like I should and there's sometimes when if I don't leave it running for periods of time it will just not start again and I also didn't really think I was going to be there that long. Um, were you afraid because your car is running somebody might steal it? No. 
Okay. It's an uh, ugly car. When you heard the ringtone, were you saying anything to the Alex about having Jason help him? No. Were you saying let him help you at all? No. Um, was Jason invited to come into the house? No, he just uh, let himself in. All right, so had you heard a knock at the door or the bell ring or anything like that? No, I didn't even know the door had opened. He just kind of burst in. Were you surprised, or let me rephrase that, what was your feeling or your emotion when you heard Jason's ringtone? I was surprised and just kind of, it shocked me. I was like, why is he just, right? why did he just let himself in? Like, what's going on? And when Jason all of a sudden shows up on the scene, yes. was there any change that you saw in Alex's demeanor? Yes. Why don't you tell us what that was? After Jason just let himself in into Alex's home, I could tell that Alex, he was no longer sitting next to me like he was. He, he stood up and he was very, I call it being bristled, but he seemed on edge. What conversation took place with Jason, you and Alex in the room? Jason kind of burst into the room and he was just using his hands a lot and he was saying, what's going on? Is everybody okay? And he was talking and I, we're, I, I kind of stepped in and I said, everything's fine, we're fine, we're just talking. And trying to calm him down, I said, we're fine, we can talk in a public place. If Who suggested public place? Kind of all did. We came to this conclusion that we should go somewhere public. But was there something to be afraid of that was going to happen in the bedroom? No. Were you concerned about what Jason might think, that you were in Alex's bedroom? Yes. And what was that about? I knew that he'd probably jump to the conclusion because that was our place where we talked, that he would assume that I had decided to sleep with him that day. Had you decided to sleep with Alex on that day? No. So after this conversation with Jason, and again, is, is Alex showing any other reaction or any other part of that conversation? He's, as I said, bristled. He's, he's frustrated. He's a little, um, he started to get quiet. And I always see that as a sign that Alex isn't particularly very happy. Who left the room first? Jason. After Jason left, what did you and Alex do? I kind of looked at him and I said, well, I guess let's, we both kind of were like, oh, I guess we should go somewhere to talk. All right. So did you and Alex leave the room? Yes. Where did you go? We went downstairs and outside. When you get downstairs and outside, what's going on? I was so confused to see that there were police vehicles there and Jason was- Did you was, call the police? No. Did, uh, at the time, did you know how the police happened to be there? No, that's why it took me by surprise so much that all of a sudden there's these two police vehicles, there's police officers. I was just like, what's, what's going on? Did the police officers come and talk to you at all? Yes, they did. Do you remember anything about their conversation? I do, yes. What do you recall? I remember they, the usual police contact. They asked for my license and my name. They asked if everything was fine and I said, yeah, we're going somewhere public to speak. Everything's fine. This is, it's, I had no concerns. How long did you talk with the police for? It wasn't very long, no. And when you were talking with the police, was there anything worrisome to you? No. After the police left, did, uh, were there any words exchanged between you and Jason or Jason and Alex at all? Yes, I had said a few things to Jason. We, we talked before we got in the car and let, well, I talked to Jason before he rode off on his bike and then I got back in the car and okay. we left. I'm gonna ask you some questions about what you were wearing on that day. All right. Um, what was, uh, how were you dressed that day? That day I was more layered and casual. I wasn't planning on dressing up because I had errands to run. Okay, aside from underwear, what was the first layer on top against your skin? What was your first layer next from to your top skin? down? So, my on first top. on top. My first layer was a yellow tiger shirt I have. 
Is that the t-shirt we saw on the screen before? Yes. And on top, what was the next layer that you had on? Was my favorite button up, which seems to have, it looks like dots, but they're little plants. It's a blue button up. I, I hate to ask you an embarrassing question, but were you wearing underwear under your clothes that day? No. Okay. Um, and um, um, so you had no underwear on, no? All right. No. And after the blue button up shirt, um, what did you, it, was that common for you to not wear underwear under your clothing? Yes, I had tights on, so that kind of what I thought counted it as underwear. Uh, and a bra, is it common for you to not wear a bra? Yes. Okay. So, um, all right, let's go back. I, I want to go back to the top garment. So I think we've talked about the t-shirt, the button-up. Yes. After the button-up, what was the next thing you had on over that? The ne next thing I had on over that was my gold sweater. Okay. And is that the gold sweater we've seen the pictures of? Sometimes yes. Sometimes gold, sometimes looks brown? Yes, it looks brown, but it's it's gold. Okay. And after the gold sweater, what did you have on top of that? I had, I have this very large, it's a flannel. It's very large on me, so I kind of use it as a coat or an overcoat. Okay. Anything else on your top half of your body? Well, around my waist, I kind of had a another sweater kind of tied loosely. It's like a long sweater. Do you know what color that was? It was kind of goldish. Okay. Um, did you, all right, let's talk about the bottom half of your body. Yes. I think you mentioned tights? Yes. Were those the tights we've seen the pictures of? Yes, my knit tights. And um, on top of the tights, what did you have? I had what's been called as mom jeans, but some light wash, high-waisted pants. Okay. Okay, uh, this is, a, is this a good spot? Uh, let me just right. ask what she had on her feet and then we can okay. finish Okay, get through this all the closely. layers and we're good. Yeah, okay. Lunch. okay. Um, were you wearing shoes on that day? Yes, I had my work boots on. Okay, uh, that's it. Okay, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna break for, again, about one hour from when we leave the courtroom. So, uh, all rise. Jury can be excused for lunch. Oh, we were just starting to get to that point where she was going to talk about what exactly happened on March 22nd, 2018. It's going to come after the lunch break. But there is so much to talk about now. What we saw this morning, her on the stand for over three hours. I have two incredible guests here in the studio joining me to help us analyze everything we saw from defendant Ezra McCandless. I have criminal defense attorney and former federal prosecutor Joe Brewer here and the Honorable Gail Tucson here as well. Thank you both so much for being with us, lending your expertise to Court TV Live. And we've got our camera on the seal there. And if anything is happening and as far as any motions or anything, we're going to go back in. But give me your impressions, please, please, as to what we saw this morning. Joe. Julie, the most confusing part about this whole case is why anyone is storing their music on an iPod in 2018. <laughs> and I know this is a pretty right. hipster crowd, so maybe thought it was some sort of antique novelty uh, to do that. But um, look, this is the this whole morning is the risk of hearsay, mm -hmm. and um, it's a unique. It's you know the lesson is, you know, if you're going to get killed by somebody. Don't put all your thoughts down in a diary and then show it to the person uh, who ultimately victimizes you because that's the, that's the way all of this stuff has gotten in. And it's allowed the defense to manage and control a narrative about Alex uh, that you just wouldn't otherwise be able to do. You wouldn't be able to get this in in any other way, but he's shown her all of this. They had all these um, intimate uh, conversations about the contents, and so she's fully qualified um, to say, these are things we talked about, and this, is, this is, was impacting me, and this influenced me. And so um, it's just a unique opportunity to use a type of evidence that normally you could never you could never get in in this right. way. Right, you're right, Joe. And I, I want to ask the judge a question on that just to kind of take it a step further. What do you think about that ruling to allow in his journals? I mean, these these uh, these thoughts of his, these intimate thoughts, these very personal thoughts, and then it's being read in open court. And and you know, Joe, as you put it, I mean, it's it's a way of, um, I guess, allowing this narrative about him to be put out. He's not here to tell us what his words meant to him, um, but they're being offered under an exception you know, to the rule against hearsay. Uh, what do you I think, Judge? Just, right, I, I agree with Joe, just mm -hmm. an incredible in, impact um, on the jury because now they have an opportunity to kind of get inside of the victim's head and, and, and 
try to understand the relationship between him um, and the defendant. Um, it's, it's unusual, uh, nothing that probably the average juror is going to be able to relate to, and so it, it certainly lays the foundation for what we anticipate you know, to be her defense. Uh, especially, I found uh, very telling her description of her you know, kind of going along with what he wanted during their um, sexual activity and um, you know, not, not resisting. So, I mean, you can just see how this leads to the ultimate moment, you know, where she's presumably going to say, you know, enough is enough and, and, right. and lost it. Right, Judge. You know, and something, we'll have to talk about this on the other side of this next break, uh, but with jurors separating what hearsay is being offered for, because here there's an exception. They're saying they're offering it for the effect on the listener, on how Ezra McCandless was feeling, the, her state of mind, what... what knowing these things did to her. So it's not being offered for the, the truth of the matter, that these things are true. But as a juror, when you're hearing this, aren't they going to accept it as truth? I feel like so it's really hard. those instructions that the judge has presumably given and will mm. give at the end of the case as to how to receive certain evidence and the mm. distinctions, um, you know, <laughs> with all due respect to our system, right. I mean, the jurors have heard it. And, right. and so they're not going to be back there saying, well, okay, we heard this for this purpose, but we can't exactly. assume that that's what really happened. Right. They've heard it. Right. We're going to keep talking. So much more to discuss. Have to take a quick break. Uh, Judge and Joe are going to stay here with us in the studio. I want you to stay with us at home when we come back. More live coverage of this head-spinning trial in the state of Wisconsin.